Hello and welcome to our Chess Journal Club webinar. And it is my honor and privilege to have Dr. Stickland and Atwood um, as part of our Journal Club panelists today. It's a very exciting study that we're going to be talking about optimizing COPD acute care patient outcomes using a standardized transition bundle and care and care coordinators. Um, I am uh, on the CHEST Journal um, editorial board, and Dr. Stickland, please, uh, if you could introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, my name is Mike Stickland. I'm a professor of pulmonary medicine at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. I'm also the scientific director for what's called the respiratory section of the Alberta Health Services uh, Medicine Strategic Clinical Network. Thank you so much. And Dr. Atwood? Hi, I'm Chantal Iwood. I currently work uh, as the team lead for methodology and executive reporting within Alberta Health Services um, within uh, the province of Alberta and Canada. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, and to be with us. So before we dive into the study, uh, we're really hoping to understand your inspiration behind, behind doing this study and uh, also what are your thoughts from um, the meta-analysis that you had conducted prior to undertaking this study? So, uh, Dr. Sticklin? Sure, I can start. Um, I guess within my position with the clinical network, we recognize that COP was, you know, was one of the top reasons for hospitalizations in, in the province of Alberta. Moreover, we saw that it was, um, the readmission rates were, were much, much higher than, than other conditions. And so we started a process uh, to try and you know, reduce um, acute care visits and reduce readmission rates and so on. We initially, several years before, we looked at sort of an, um, an admission order set to try and standardize care and trying to, to standardize care in hospitals to, to ensure patients you know, try and get through hospitals sort of as efficiently as possible. Um, and then the next step is sort of naturally to look at readmission rates. And so there's an opportunity um, to get a grant to, to, through the Alberta Innovates Health Solutions to, to basically run a trial to look at finding ways to implement a, a transition bundle to, to reduce um, readmission rates. Um, the first step of that was uh, the systematic review. I always kind of laugh because the systematic review was a very important step. Um, we took about a couple of months to sort of uh, identify element, identify papers that, that use different kinds of transition bundles um, for COPD. Um, this is important for the larger work because it did, for example, it identified all the different elements that, that made up um, the bundles and so on. But I, I always laugh because this was about a two month process to sort of um, summarize what was currently known, uh, really nice systematic review, boom, done in two months, published fairly, fairly quickly. And, you know, that was the easy part was sort of figuring out what, 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 what elements were needed. The actual trial to, to get it was, was the much more difficult part that took uh, many, many more months than that. Thank you so much. And Dr. Atwood? Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, that's, a, that's exactly how this, this came, came to be. I don't really have a lot to, to add. And, you know, like you're saying, the easy part was getting that systematic review for a lot of us who are trying to do systematic reviews to get a sense of lay of the land. It, it takes much longer than two months. So props to you for getting it done in two months. And with that, let's go into the meat of the, the trial, the study design. And, and what made you choose the study design of having, uh, you know, a nested randomized controlled clinical trial uh, within this larger cohort study. So Dr. Atwood, you're a methodology expert. Tell us more. Um, well, thank you with the expert part, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, essentially we, we started out wanting to like, as scientists, let's, let's shoot for the stars. Let's get everything. Let's, let's go for all of these hospitals. Let's implement in all of these hospitals, hospital wide. Um, and then the clinical reality kind of set in and hit us with, uh, that's a lot to do. And we just don't have the personnel or the resourcing to, to kind of go beyond, you know, certain levels or wards or units. So what happened was that we, we came up, we started with our power calculations and, and, and figured out what we exactly needed to get, you know, you know, the science, the, we needed this, this many people to get 80% power. So that's where we started. And then, we started implementing in the hospitals and they were telling us, well, we can, I know you wanted 10 units, but we'll give you one because that's all we can do right now. So we started um, with, with that and trying to 
get more scale and spread throughout more of the hospitals. But it was really kind of an uphill battle trying to trying trying to balance competing priorities, trying to balance a lot of other um, initiatives that were kind of going on simultaneously, not through us. And uh, so, um, well, at the end of the day, we had to, we saw that as the data was coming in, we're like, well, we, and what, what can we do to get the best to, to investigate this, the best way to like maximize the science, but also have the clinical aspect and, and flexibility that we need to have built in. And that's sort of how we came up with this, um, this idea of, well, it's now a cohort study because our cohort is COPD patients. We're following them somewhat longitudinally for 90 days. Um, and then we're now nesting, uh, an RCT in it because now we're looking at the care coordinator part. So it's really, I think it's kind of a cool, a really cool and crafty way to accomplish both like the real world setting that is doing work inside of a hospital, but also trying to like add science to it with, uh, with the RCT of the, and, and the, and the evidence-based best practice with the transition bundle. So. You bring up a very important point for healthcare delivery. And when we look at health services research, implementation science, and often when we're thinking about quality improvement type studies, they don't always meet the scientific rigor of health services research or implementation science. So it's very interesting how you both try to capture that pragmatism that you want to give the teams that flexibility. You don't want to deviate too much from their usual care. Also in some ways, facilitating uptake of that bundle, this idea that, you know, here's a problem and you're looking at it from a very scientific, from a very systematic manner to solve. So of course, acute COPD exacerbations, rehospitalizations. I mean, that's, that's a massive problem. So being able to, change how information and care is delivered. Um, it, it's, it's a very interesting approach to, to do this. I was looking at some of your sample size calculations and those numbers were, were daunting. So uh, <laughs> tell me a little bit more about that. So when you look at your sample size, um, did you for a moment think, oh my God, we should not do this? I personally did not. I thought I'm still like this, this gung ho scientist saying, yeah, we could do this. We'll just keep on going. Like mine, we'll just extend the length of the study. It's great. Like no problem. And then the front line and the clinicians were like, uh, we're tired of this now. <laughs> so, so then it started becoming, you could see it in the data. Like it, it started, um, it wasn't as as exciting coming in as it as it started out to be. So you could see that there was fatigue on the level of the clinicians, and and so that's kind of a lesson learned as well. Like you can have all the best efforts and the best best researched approach to doing something, and then there's still going to be there's still going to be things that come up, barriers that come up, and you just have to roll with the punches and 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 then just keep trying, I guess. But um, Mike, Absolutely. do you want to add something to this? Yeah, I was just, I mean, I remember writing the grant, right? And, and we were going to have these five sites identified. They were, you know, there were some great champions there. Okay, it makes sense. It's a great site. And we talked about, you know, randomizing by site, you know, so that we would sort of select the random, you know, which site would go first. But again, practically speaking, you're, you're talking about a huge amount of implementation here. So, you know, while it would have been great to say, okay, you know, site X, you're going to go in July 1st or whatever. It just, it just didn't happen that way. Right. And we, we realized pretty early on that we couldn't necessarily tell us, I know you got to wait two months. I know you're ready, but, but you've been randomized to go second or whatever. So again, the implementation was such, and you see it in, in that figure there that, you know, we, we kind of, you know, and, and every site was about a year behind what we wanted to initially. Right. But we had to sort of launch them when they were ready. Um, and similarly, again, as we started to talk about the study, I mean, the ideal way is to randomize where every second person essentially got the discharge bundle. But there's no way you could ever do that on the front line. You can't, you know, you can't have a ward say, well, this patient is going to get it, this patient's not. It, it, it would drive the, the staff crazy, right? So again, we had to use this, this cohort essentially. Um, again, I think we were, it was, it was nice to be able to do the RCT on um, the, the care coordinator piece, because again, like, um, on a system level, it would be wonderful if we could reduce hospitalizations with essentially a, a series of, of, you know, a form or a, or a simple bundle. But we know, of course, that the patients need some kind of follow-up. So, you know, being able to test that piece within an RCT, I think, was nice. 
Uh, again, it, it, you know, there were some practical issues on the front line that, 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 that were challenging, but it at least allowed us to sort of, again, be able to separate out the, the orders or the discharge bundle or transition bundle by itself versus um, that plus the care coordinator. I thought that was very smart and trying to do uh, perhaps a, a bundled intervention where you looked at the transition bundle plus the coordinator and then trying to randomize people into a bundled intervention with the transition bundle plus a care coordinator, that would have been even more complex to do. So in some ways, you're achieving uh, that flexibility that you were looking for, keeping it very pragmatic. Sites can do what they need to do, provide care as usual. So lots of advantages to picking this this, uh, study design. And uh, any things that you would want to highlight for our audience on this uh, figure before we move from study design into uh, uh, more of uh, the transition bundle and how that was designed? I think only the two things that I really want to that I would want to highlight is that if if anyone is ever going to undertake this kind of work, it is really important to build in that flexibility. So sure, you have a standardization standard of or a standardized piece of care or standard of care for your for your patient, but every hospital you implement in is going to have a different culture and they're going to have a different way of of doing the thing. So if you give them the thing to do, you can't also tell them how to do the thing. So you need to be able to have that built-in flexibility. Um, With this particular flowchart of the patients, so yeah, we, we were able to encompass the the clinical care environment and and to really have what does it look like to do work within a healthcare system. But the problem, it's not really a problem. It's just that you get a lot more exclusions. So mm-hmm. that's the part that becomes daunting then. So like when, when you have this sort of sort of static, not really static, but maybe cleanse, sterile, a really research environment where you have an RCT, like this is what you're going to do and everything else is is controlled for, which is ideally what an RCT is supposed to be. Then you can control for how many patients you're really going to include and exclude. With this, it's kind of like in order to embody that clinical environment, you can't have that sterile scientific environment at the same time. And so that's why we lost a lot of people to exclusion. And that's another reason why we didn't really get a lot of our... um, to meet the the daunting population numbers, but. No, absolutely. But at the same time, despite excluding all those those, uh, patients, the fact that this was meant for improving healthcare delivery in usual care environments, that's exactly what you designed for. That's exactly what you tested. Awesome. So let's let's move from from there to, uh, let me see if I'm, I can go over first to the transition bundle. So let's talk a little bit about the elements of the transition bundle and how was this designed and why did you choose paper, for example, as compared to electronic? Yeah. So maybe I'll start with a bit of the sort of the other background and then maybe some talk about sort of the implementation piece. Um, yeah, so, so that systematic review that we did, um, again, part of that, it's important because again, what it, it, it identified a total of 29 different unique care items that have been done in previous bundles. And, and obviously there was a struggle of, you know, what's the most important, how many should we have? And, and there, you know, there was a signal in the, in the literature that it, you didn't want to have it too, too many. It needed to be somewhere between sort of five to 10 and so on. And so what we did is we took the 29 items and then we did a series of we did Delphi or basically did two surveys. We involved patients, we involved, um, healthcare staff that included physicians, respiratory therapists, nurses, PTs, um, both folks that, that work in acute care as well as primary care, respirologists, internal medicine, and so on. And we did a series of surveys and basically to try and whittle down what were the most important elements and, and whittle down to, to a, a, a smaller number. And we actually finished with a workshop and we invited, um, in Canada, we have what's called the Canadian Thurasic Society, COPD Assembly. So a lot of uh, national leaders in the COPD, we brought them in and we had this big workshop with them and they get all our, our clinicians and, and patients and, and whittled it down to these seven items. And, and again, I guess it was basically, um, you know, expert opinion and patient uh, uh, support as far as what, what were the top items. So that's how we got to the seven items. Um, Maybe I'll turn over to Chantel and she can talk about how we took those seven items and brought them in front of the, the, the clinician. 
Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the basically how we we brought the seven these seven items into what we call a transition bundle. So basically, um, there's research out there that shows that, um, and, and a lot of healthcare organizations start to use this, is that um, the airline, actually, when they have the checklist items, that nothing gets missed. So that gets implemented a lot of times in, in, in healthcare, because if you have a checklist, you know, things don't get missed. So that's what we did. Well, let's just implement it this way. So we have at the end of a lot of patient care before before the patient gets discharged, here are some items that we need to or elements that we need to go over and discuss. And so they became checklist items. Um, and we kind of so you'll you should almost that there's seven of them, but we kind of brought them up. If there was an and, then that would be a separate item, you know. So then it technically became, I think, eleven as soon as you start breaking up the ands. But yeah, so this is how we we started to capture it and um, how we implemented it was a different so that that that's like the technical piece but how we actually got this into process flow that's the tr that's the difficult piece and so yeah we we met with all of our um, well, we call them LITs or uh, local implementation teams. I'm so glad you, like, you bring that up. I was going to ask you about your champions, right? So in some ways, they, they sound like lit champions. Yeah, they are lit, for sure. <laughs> um, so they, so we we got a group of of people together at each hospital, and they were they're multi, um, multi factorial in their in their specialties. So it was like all PTRTs. Uh, OTs, uh, nurses, um, we had pharmacy on there, physicians, like, so it was like very, very much a group, a team project, a team effort. And like, which is, which is how you, you have to accomplish this because not everyone is going to be able to give, um, frailty screening, right? Not everyone else is going to be able to talk to respiratory medications and optimizing and optimizing and reconciling those medications. So it really is a group effort. And the more time, more times you get more people involved, the more chance you're going to have success. So, and, and the, so we got these people together and we started doing a gap analysis within, within each hospital. So what are you doing as usual care and how can this, um, this transition bundle sort of fill in the gaps or, or make your work easier, you know, like, educate the patient. Oh, great. Well, how do you want me to educate the patient? Well, now we're breaking that up into little discretized buckets that you can actually do, like teach the patient, make sure that they know how to use their inhaler kind of thing. Awesome. Um, uh, really empowering the, the patient. kinds of things you were also sharing during your learning collaborative meetings, because you also had this, um, you also had these monthly learning collaborative meetings and were these like site specific or you had all the sites come together, learn from each other? What did that look like? Right. So um, so the monthly meetings were audit and feedback meetings. That would be where, where um, I went and chatted with them about their data, where things were kind of slipping, where they were doing great. Like so we needed a little bit of cheerleading because it can't be all like hammer, hammer, hammer. You're doing things. You need to pick up your socks here. Like it has to be like, hey, you're doing great over here. We can we can work on this area. So that was the monthly meetings to really help each local improvement team really understand their data and how to work through it. The learning collaborators that we had, there were about five of them, and they were kind of spread out every almost every quarter, give or take, whatever wherever we could get a big enough facility together. And then we would grab all of the all of the local improvement teams and the physicians and, and everyone else who wanted to be part of it within the hospitals. They would all come together. We'd have um hospitals working with other hospitals like to so where one hospital would have they would have this this issue and they were like oh well we, this is how we overcame x and so it'd be like oh great well this hospital is having that problem now maybe you guys can see if that's going to work you know your 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 solution can work across the hospitals and so we would have like um hospitals teaching hospitals how they overcome certain areas and and or issues or barriers and and really putting this into a uh, effective process flow within their work environment so awesome. it could actually get done you know that that obviously sounds like a lot a lot of work on your part uh, and i hope that all the teams that participated appreciated that as much so you selected five sites and was there any particular reason for selecting those five sites i'll let mike talk to that one I think basically it started with champions at those sites um you know we did want sort of a mix of of urban rural um, one site is although actually they're, they're all they're all fairly large hospitals but um yeah essentially two in calgary two in edmonton and then, and then one in, in the city of red deer which has a population of about uh, seventy thousand people but um 
yeah, it really came down initially to, to site champions, to be honest. Awesome. So moving from the idea of site champions, you've got the bundle down. Uh, now let's go into some of our you know, primary, secondary, tertiary outcomes. Um, so starting with looking at that readmission and those ED, ED visits, um, just a couple of words about that uh, nested RCT. So you, you had the care coordinators meet with patients who were randomized into the intervention arm at specific frequencies. Any specific uh, reasons why you chose those two frequencies at like 40, 48 to 72 hours versus seven to, seven to 10 days? Yeah, I think that the, the care coordinator role responsibility and sort of that frequency was certainly a, a topic of discussion of our group. Um, you know, at the most basic level, we all believe, you know, COPD management and, and education, those pieces are really, really important. Um, but it's sort of a balance, you know, in our case, we didn't have the budget for a formal care coordinator that would, or sorry, a, a sort of a, um, that's the word I'm looking for, Chantel. Um, yeah, care coordinator, like we didn't, you know, there's, there's um, work in the COP education literature that would say, you know, a pay, or case manager, pardon me, it, you know, that, that a case manager type of role is, is really effective at, at, at helping to, to, to sort of co-manage the patient. But we didn't have the budget for, for, for someone to interact, you know, with patients uh, multiple times, um, you know, and, and to really you know, provide one-on-one -on -one education, those types of things. So our, you know, and again, as part of the, of, of, of like we did some focus groups to understand the patients and understand the challenges that they had on discharge. And, you know, they sort of felt that, you know, they needed somebody to help with, with appointments and, and, and those types of things. And so we sort of designed this, this role of, of, of being someone again, who just sort of provides um, some follow-up can provide some phone numbers, maybe make a phone call for them to align them to rehab or, or, or their primary care physician. But it wasn't somebody who was going to take a sort of a hugely active role in, in their care. Um, as far as the, the follow-up times, again, I think we just sort of, you know, in, in discussions with the patients and discussions with some of our, our, our primary care and physician and, and acute care colleagues, people thought, you know, in that first few days, obviously it's still, still a pretty traumatic event, but that would be a time where you could probably try and hopefully close some loops quickly. Um, we of course know that things like rehab, if you're done within the first month, the patients see their primary care physician the first couple of weeks, those things do reduce readmission rates. We wanted to try and get them as soon as possible. So we thought again, that first sort of within three days is a good period. And then a follow-up around seven to 10 days was about ideal. Um, again, it came down to sort of budget and, and, and timelines. I'm sure a more proactive, a more involved um, sort of case manager would, would be more effective, um, but we wanted something that, again, we thought would be scalable for the health system. And would not be too costly either, right? I think having, having uh, your care coordinators were either respiratory therapists or RNs um, who were providing some of these coordination calls. So, um, uh, Shantel... Yes. Please. Sorry, if I can just add to what was also fascinating and quite difficult and, and kind of shocking to me, like, again, five different hospitals, but every single hospital, and, and in two cases, the two hospitals in the same city, literally just like across the river, and yet their discharge process, their follow-up process is sort of very different. And, and they would be discharged to different primary care networks. And again, some of those primary care networks had alerts set in such that they would find out that their patients were discharged from hospitals, some did not. And so it was just shocking how different in this, in, in theory, provincial healthcare system, how different the acute care sites were on discharging and uh, that the primary care sites were on sort of receiving information following up. So this was again, uh, specific enough, but hopefully being flexible enough to be a, across these five sites and all the various primary care areas. I think uh, you, I'm so glad you bring up the care variability component, even in, in, uh, you know, in, in a setting that has 
the potential to have more standardization. Uh, it speaks to the external validity of some of the work that you've done. In the US, we don't have any sort of standardization in follow-ups, even within the same health system. So let alone, you know, between different, uh, different health systems and different hospitals and different regions of the country, so on and so forth. And then also in rest of the world. So that care variability just exists everywhere. And is there, is there some way of uh, understanding the utility of having a standardized transition bundle, a potential care coordinator in those kind of settings? Uh, I think the study, despite having been done in a uh, what may seem like a more uniform setting as compared to some of the other settings, just the fact that you mention all this care variability, uh, I, I think it speaks a lot to that uh, external validity of what you have found. Well, because again, like we initially thought maybe the care coordinator could be embedded in primary care. We, we could just, you know, sort of link them to primary care. But again, in Edmonton, which is a population of over a million people, there's four or five different primary care networks and they have completely different processes. And so we couldn't, you know, and if you're going from one hospital, you could be just discharged that, again, up to five different primary care networks. So we couldn't embed five different people in those places. So this is where we had to go at the hospital level with, with this person. But it, yeah, it just speaks to the variability and it was... It was shocking how much variability there was there, to be honest. And that's Very only valid. within five. Like, if we, if we wanted to scale and spread this across the entire province and get everyone on board, we're talking 42 primary care networks. Like, that, and that's, and that's, so a primary care network in, in, in Alberta is basically a big or like a, a network. So it's mandated by the, or accountable to the ministry of health. And so it's like this area that encapsulates a whole bunch of, of primary care docs, of different uh, community care uh, resources like rehab and, and physio and those kind of things, just kind of give a little bit of incentive for why a physician would want to, to become part of the network. A physician can operate outside the network, totally fine as well. But like we're talking now 42 primary care networks provincially, not including all these people who aren't involved. So like variability is like is a thing. It becomes exponential, right? The, the more right. elements elements you try to add. So taking a look at uh, this forest plot showing the overall analysis of the effects. Um, uh, Mike and Chantel, anything you want to highlight for our uh, for our listeners? Sure, I can start. I mean, I, again, I think we were quite happy with the, this, you know, the reduction seven day and, and, and 30 day readmission rates. I think, you know, um, we've done an economic analysis and that's going to be a follow up paper. And again, it did amount to substantial cost savings with respect to the project. And of course, there is a reduction in mortality with the uh, with the bundle. Um, I think obviously the, the, the one that sticks out that there was a surprise is the 30 day ED revisits. Mm -hmm. um, that was certainly something unexpected, but was observed in the trial. And Chantel, any thoughts on why the ED, ED visits increased in the intervention group? I have some thoughts. I have a lot more questions, but um, <laughs> so like for, for the 30 day ED revisits, like ooh, there in 2019, Hanan Bumatar found a very similar thing, like that these patients, when given education, now they're a little bit more uh, aware of their symptomology and their symptoms. And so before um, they sustained an exacerbation in, in specifically COPD, but this could go for any chronic disease, any kind of exacerbation or um, deterioration in their, in their health, they're like, oh, okay, well, I should probably go to, to, to emerge. So I think that's what's happening. They're just more symptom aware and they don't want to decompensate. So because they don't want to spend time and who wants to spend time in a hospital? Like, seriously. So, um, so I think that's what they're doing. They're trying to actually take control of their, of their health and try to do the best thing that they think they can. Now, I do also believe like the, the mean age of our patients that, that is in this study that is in this data is around 70 years of age on both sides. So like that's where they're going to in their mind. Like that's where, that's where help is, is in the hospital. I, I think that it's going to be a culture change to talk, to really start talking about, okay, primary care environment, primary care doctor, uh, urgent care facilities, something outside of the hospital, you know, like those are the places you should be. I think with this transition bundle and the communication, the education that the acute care clinicians are giving, I think that's the first step, but I do think it's going to be a huge culture shift to actually get people to start thinking like Emerge is not the place that you should go all the time. Granted, yeah, it probably is, but. Yeah, I think you're right though. It highlights the gap, right? That, that these patients don't see, maybe there isn't 
a service out there or they don't see the service where patients can get sort of rapid access to follow up, but not in the emerge. Yeah. So this leads to a lot more questions that I have. Like, I would like to look at the timing of when these patients actually went to eMERGE, because is it during the day when they should be going to primary care and urgent care? Because then that would be like, okay, well, we need to do more more education, or maybe they're not aware. Or maybe it's like they're actually visiting eMERGE and it's like 10 o'clock at night when everything's closed. Okay, well, then that's logical. <laughs> eMERGE is the appropriate place to go, right? So like, these are the more questions that I would love to follow up on. But Absolutely. And I'm, 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 again, what you're highlighting right now, the fact that a lot of people, uh, a lot of our patients go to uh, emergency rooms to seek care, which could very well be part of their usual care, primary care. Uh, it shows a gap in knowledge and also access to resources, uh, whether everybody has access to primary care or not. And how many yeah. of these patients are aware of how to reach their primary care uh, physicians. Um, with the advent of telehealth and COVID-19 has given this big boost to, to telehealth, is that going to help bridge some of that gap? And of course, your, your, you know, your study is uh, very much right, uh, uh, you know, uh, at least a couple of years before the pandemic. It'll be interesting to see how the pandemic changes, exactly how the pandemic changes uh, you know, some of this uh, care utilization, whether people are actually going to just call their uh, PCPs up or leverage telehealth to get simple questions answered rather than showing up in the emergency rooms. So what I'm hearing from you is the fact that there was an uptick in the ED visits may actually be a positive thing with people taking more charge of their health and being more aware of their symptoms. Is that fair to say? I think it is. And again, what's interesting is while there was greater ED visits, it didn't translate to greater admissions. Okay. So these patients just came and, you know, because of symptoms, and that, but they were not admitted. And, and I think most that's of the, the time, positive part. Yeah, because I think in uh, Alberta, and Chantelle, you know the data better, but most of the time a COPD patient shows up and emerge, well, they're, they're admitted about 80% of the time. So again, yep. most, you know, these patients came, but they were not admitted. That's a great point. Great point. And um, any comments on the descriptive data? Um, it looked fairly well distributed, except for a couple of, uh, you know, chronic conditions like heart failure, uh, liver disease, but otherwise a fairly well distributed uh, group, right? And yeah. uh, again, to, to highlight this for our readers, this is not randomization into transition bundle. This was exposure to transition bundle. And the exposure was determined by the sites themselves, whether they wanted to provide that bundle uh, to a particular patient or not. And despite that, the groups are fairly well distributed. So despite not being randomized, you know, uh, they're more or less well distributed. Any comments on the CTAS? Uh, it's a, a Canadian specific uh, um, uh, severity scoring system. Comments on that? Right. So CTAS is a Canadian triage acuity standard. So basically, as you present to, it's, it's supposed to help the triage nurse once you present to emerge how how to scale you um, based on your symptoms um, for how, how quickly you should be seen by a clinician. So just really another another piece like we should be assuming that a patient who is of a CTAS-1, which is resuscitative, well, they should be seen as urgent priority, like like right now, because they are coming in likely unconscious and in a state of shock. Whereas, you know, um, so it's just really categorizing why we controlled, we put this in our control group because like they're kind of spread oh, all yeah, over. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And we didn't want that to actually influence our data, like saying that if we didn't control for it, they would be a confounding saying like, well, different patients are different. Well, yeah, we're trying to get rid of that argument because a lot of times we do, we did get a lot of that, that argument with my patients in, in, in this hospital, different than your patients down there. It's like, well, we tried to standard, we're trying to level the playing field, including like your CTAS score and, and all age sex, um, your comorbidities, because right, like some people may have diabetes, some people may not, some people may have heart failure, some people may not, like, so this and case, so we're trying to say it doesn't matter. You did a lot of that kind of standardization, right? You had the Carlson comorbidity, you had age and uh, um, sex and the case mix index, CTAS. So you really tried, despite all that care variability and not being able to randomize by site, in the covariates, you tried to uh, tried to adjust for a lot of that stuff. So, yeah. um, 
And then looking at our table, table three, which um, again looks at usual care transition bundle, and then this follow up with primary care uh, within the first 14 days or so. And then what was the, the median follow up? Any comments on this? Well, I must confess, I, I like this data because um, when we were doing this whole thing, going, going back years, I, I said, you know, if we could just accomplish that these patients see their primary care physician like sooner, they'll be a success. You know, like I'd like, because if we were trying to do all these things, referral to rehab, all these things, it's like, if we can just have them see their patient or their their, their physician, I'd see, we know that would be successful. And so I was happy to see that we were able to accomplish that. Awesome. And Chantel, any comments on that? Oh, no, this this data just really this makes great, me right? super excited. Like the, this is a success in transitions in care right there. Just this table right there. And and it just gives me goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. It makes me happy. Awesome. Um, and then looking at, um, you know, looking at, again, no, no care coordinator, now drilling down in, into that nested RCT, um, uh, the intention to treat analysis and the readmissions and then breaking down those readmissions by seven day, 30 day, 90 day. Um, so comments on this. I, I was excited to see it. Um, so when you're in the, when you're going through the midst of it and in the weeds, I wasn't even thinking about stats going, going through it and implementing. I was just like, please, can we just have some good effect, have some good outcomes for the patient? Like just kid like just can this work and then to actually come back and start seeing hey babe seven day readmissions decrease 30 day readmissions decrease like that's that's pretty big now 90 day readmissions had no effect but that's three months away these people are 70 years of age this is all caused readmissions i suspect that a 70 year old's gonna come back to the hospital within three months so i'm not really phased by that but the 30 days you're not coming back as much within 30 days to me that's a huge win that's a huge win that this is actually working in transitions now the seven day readmissions being lowered that tells me that you've done a great job in in, in the care for the patient, because like, wait, if you come back within seven days, that kind of tells me that mm, there may be something, you may have discharged the patient a little too early. So this tells me that didn't, that wasn't the case. 30 day readmissions, great. Then we're having a success in transitions in care, 90 day readmissions, no effect, mm, not phased. Now that those are really great points. And particularly when you look at the cohort, it's mostly people between 70 to about 73 or so. Um, do you think that was the reason for why the length of stay in the intervention group was a little bit higher as compared to that more attention was being paid? So length of stay, that's a fun, that's a funny little, uh, so, okay. I'm going to be quite honest. I don't like length of stay as a really good indicator of care because some people may need more care than others. And now we're saying that your ability to stay longer is gonna be judged, it's gonna be a deciding factor as to whether or not you've given them good care or not. I just, I don't really love length of stay. Another piece is that this actually focused on transitions, discharge and then transitioning to uh, primary care. Length of stay to me is, um, is a measure of how quickly can we control the exacerbation of the patient, which is really the physician order sets, you know, the medications you're giving, the oxygen you're giving, all of those kinds of things. Not necessarily, hey, can you show me how you use your inhaler? Like, but also, in if we're going to talk about this uh, as far as an, an, indica an indicator of, of for, for this study, Anecdotally, it's been told to us uh, from the front line is that if you're not planning discharge around the patient admission, they're going to probably stay longer because now you're taking all of this discharge stuff that they had that the clinicians have to do and you're slamming it right up against uh, the time that the patient's going to be discharged. So now you have to, oh, well, we can't get a pharmacist. Okay, you have to stay longer. Oh, you don't have a ride home. Oh, okay, well, now you have to stay longer. So I think all of these things are just multifactorial in how in, in length of stay. Um, but that's just my bit. My no, that's, that's all, all very well, well taken. And length of stay tends to be a messy variable. It may not be directly, uh, you know, reflective of the care that's being, being provided for all of the different reasons you mentioned. So also is, is that additional, um, you know, a day or two that any intervention is adding to the length of stay, if it's being offset by the cost of, 
rehospitalizations and your seven day visits and so on and so forth it almost makes you wonder right maybe that patient really did need to stay in the hospital for that day longer who knows and like well, honestly we're talking 7.3% increased risk of staying one day longer like 7.3% is what we're talking about here like they have a statistically significant but is that clinically relevant who knows right Absolutely. sorry mike go ahead well yeah and, and i think to to the earlier point i mean what we actually saw again from the when we do the health economics analysis while we do see this increase in 7% of the time while looking for its length of stay, um, the overall net effect is indeed a, a cost savings. So um, to your point about, you know, maybe that little bit extra time is actually not a bad thing um, in this case. But yes, I mean, I think we're, we're all disappointed with the increased length of stay risk there. That was unintended for sure. And again, previous work we've done where we do an order set, we actually reduce length of stay. So we were hoping to get at least that, that improvement, but um, yes bit of an unintended consequence. I, I guess just one of the flip sides of having an increased length of stay when um, when folks who want to implement such uh, intensive interventions and which are cost-saving interventions, when you try to make that argument to hospital administrators, they they just look at the, the length of stay or, yeah. you know, some of these other, other metrics that become more important, but the health economics, I'm super excited to see your health economics study. So hopefully we'll be talking about that next time uh, on one <laughs> of our journal clubs. Um, so I think we're winding down with, with some of the data and I would love to get your closing, closing thoughts on this. We kind of went over the length of stay uh, discussions as well. And uh, all the all the primary outcomes, all of your points are really well taken. So, in in terms of closing thoughts, what do we want our listeners to take away from this study, uh, both about implementation science as a whole for chronic chronic medical conditions like COPD, and uh, words of wisdom. When you are undertaking these kinds of studies, uh, I think both of you, you know, uh, you've done a wonderful job of tying that in throughout the discussion. So, would love for you to share your closing thoughts, crystallize some points for our for our listeners. I always make this joke privately, but I'll do it across the internet. The internet now, I make the joke that before this this trial, I had a lot more hair than I actually do right now. Um, <laughs> I think it highlights sort of the complexity of the implementation. You know, we talked about how we we picked these five sites because they had been champions, right? But you know, and that champion might have been a really keen physician um, or or allied health professional or something like that. But the reality is, you needed champions on multiple levels within a hospital to make this work. And um, anytime, you know, we had, you know, the, the amount of hiccups we would have, like, you know, if you look at the, the discharge bundle and, you know, we'd have, um, you know, a group identify a challenge and, and the whole implementation would stop for a month or two, we'd have a series of meetings before going forward. So even though, you know, again, we did sort of the academic pursuit, we did some um, focus groups on, you know, barriers, facilitators, all those types of things. Um, the implementation was was extremely complex. I think we probably, you know, focused too much on things like education and maybe didn't, you know, look at the harder questions like, you know, how do we, you know, is the system able to handle this? You know, it's not, not you know, we have to be careful. We see this, especially now with COVID, you don't just put more on the physician or the allied health staff. You have to find a system that's going to make this easier. I mean, we're I think we're proud to say that from this, this is, you know, I think an earlier question was sort of why was this paper, and, you know, um, paper and pen? Well, it's because again, multiple systems had different, you know, um, some some hospitals were still on paper-based order sets, some had electronic, but it was different, and so this is the only way to try and do a, uh, a systematic approach. But um, our province has moved to one electronic medical record or, or management system, and we're very, very proud to say that this uh, order uh, discharge bundle or transition bundle has been integrated now into the order set pieces. And so if you have COPD, this would be the order set and discharge piece that you would get. And so we're excited that sort of now from an implementation uh, standard, it, it becomes standard of care. Um, so that you know, again, our colleagues are working on, on on that, and obviously, COVID's made a bit of a hiccup with respect to implementing this province-wide um, electronic system, but it's it's coming now. So, um, yeah, that's I think that's the exciting part that we have actually take that you know what we started as a systematic review implementation project, showing in good outcomes, and now it's standard of care. Tell that's that's an awesome story. You know, you, you started with that systematic review. You got inspired by a big problem that your patients were were experiencing with acute exacerbations of COPD, 
and uh, thinking through all those different points. So uh, you've got to find your champions. You've got to be flexible. You've got to adapt and don't give up even if you're losing hair, right? That's Amen. Right. <laughs> all right. Uh, Chantel, words of wisdom and closing thoughts. Um, yeah. So like, just like, just to sh- shadow on, on what Mike says, like, this, this standard of care is now going to be implemented for a lot of patients with chronic conditions. So it's not just COPD, it's heart failure as well. It's diabetes as well. It's So this is like a chronic care path, not just COPD. So where you have COPD specific pieces, like um, uh, inhaler demonstration, like that could be um, daily weights for heart failure patients. It could be blood sugar levels and, di- and diet for diabetes patients. So it's it's very, very much like this. We're now taking this awesome, this awesome piece of work and we're sort of massaging it into, if you want to call it disease agnostic, which is going to probably send a lot of hairs up on people's ends if they hear this, but you know, that could, that it could be the a little piece and then you get into disease specific. So that's awesome. The other piece that's really that's really um, a take home for this is that we've now not just had this transition uh, bundle. It's actually being put with an order set as well. So now with the order set that we showed previously decreases, it's uh, um, by Sachin Pendarker, 2018 uh, study showed that um, 1.15 days is what we could decrease in length of stay, which is the, you know, about the same amount that we increased. So like now using an order set, we can decrease length of stay with using this transition bundle, we can decrease readmissions up to 30 days. Like this is pretty great. Um, The other thing that is a take home lesson for me personally is we need to empower the patient. It can't be all on the clinicians. We need to give the the power to the patient. So we did this by giving them a piece of paper. We, and like, and this is another um, anecdotal piece of information we got from frontline if you give the patients booklets of stuff they're going to file it under g for garbage or r for recycling whatever you want to do but if you actually write on it then that becomes an important piece of paper for them so now we've explained to them everything on this uh, discharge management plan or this transition bundle what's happened to you why has it happened to you how do you care for yourself like uh, and you're in your condition what should you be watchful for empowering the patient essentially and then we sign it and then give it to the patient and say take this to your family doctor within 14 days And they're like, okay, now I know next steps. Now I know how to try to navigate through part of this system, this complex healthcare system. Then they're 70 years old. I don't know. I think about my grandma. She's probably a little bit forgetful. So like we have now this care coordinator that's calling and saying, hey, have you you booked your primary care physician or your family doctor appointment? Have you have you talked to them? So then another reminder. And I think that phone call piece is really important for the 70 year olds of today. That is not going to work for the 70 year olds of tomorrow. So when I get 70, I'm probably going to ignore that phone call. But if you send me a text message, I'll be like, got you. And I because I personally love these text message reminders that I have an appointment right now. So I think that is something that we maybe need a central navigation system where we need to help the patient navigate to the next step of where they need to go. And, and reminders. So that was a lot, but that's what I learned. So empower your patients, personalize their care. So just writing something down, reminding them why something is important and phone call. It sounds like you're all about the P's and powers of so patient empowerment, right? And phone calls and personalization and trying to meet the patient where they're at. I think there's a lot of great takeaways from this journal club, not just for COPD, but for a lot of other chronic medical conditions as well. I love the fact that your transition bundle has made it to an order set because if it's not being used on the front lines, uh, no matter how are the frontline providers going to get that reminder? There is no care coordinator reminding them to send the transition bundle out. So uh, as much as order sets um, you know, are, are difficult to, to build appropriately and, and with smart intention, but the fact that you've done all this scientific rigor, you've looked at what elements should be included, you passed it down from you know, 29 interventions down to seven. There's so much great work. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. It's been wonderful chatting with you. 